So right now we're studying the book of Matthew. Uh, here's what we've got, so you know the direction we're going in. This is the third class. I'm still giving a lot of uh, pre-information. Uh, the worst part to do is when you go into a book such as Matthew, is for, to assume your audience knows what's in the author's mind and the people's mind and who he's writing it to. So I'm trying to set the climate so you can understand the time in which Matthew wrote to the people he wrote and what was going on when the Messiah, Jesus himself, was became a human being and lived on earth. What happened? Because if you don't realize it, if you have a Bible that says right before Matthew, it says New Testament, you are not in New Testament times. You're still in an Old Testament economy. You're in a time when Israel was directed by God for certain things and to do certain things and, and to be certain things. And Jesus comes into the nation of Israel to be their Messiah, to bring their kingdom. And his ministry was to Jewish people. Just for a sake of conversation before we get into some of this, go to Matthew chapter 10. And I do, would, I, I do ask of you to do your due diligence to start reading ahead in Matthew and start writing down some questions. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pose a lot of questions when we actually go verse by verse because there's a lot of confusion in Matthew and whys that we should ask. So we're going to ask some questions and answer it. Um, but it's very interesting. You get to um, chapter 10 of Matthew and... And Jesus basically is picking out his disciples in verse 5. says, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them. He says, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Now, I would say to you today, if you go out of this building and you want to give the gospel, only find Jewish people. How would you feel about that? You would say what? That's kind of prejudice, don't you think? So if you look at Jesus, the ministry he's sending them out on, it's to present the kingdom, not to go to the Gentiles, not to go to the Samaritans. It says, rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the direction that we got to take in this book is understanding this is to the Jew first. How did they receive this book? The guy that's writing its name is Levi, not Matthew. Understand that. He's very Jewish in a very Jewish time period and a very Jewish understanding. Um, I don't know how more Jewish I can make it. (laughs) And when he says this to them, notice what he says, verse 7, and as you go, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message. If you're looking for the gospel of the cross of Christ, in the first chapters, at least of Matthew, you're not going to find it. Do you understand that? Jesus was on earth. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't been crucified. Hadn't been buried. Hasn't been resurrected and surely has not ascended. He's on earth, and he's giving directives to especially these guys called his disciples to do certain things. Uh, Then he goes on to say to them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely you give. He gave them credentials of the king to go out and present certain things that we're not to do today. I'm not going to ever send somebody out in mission and say, hey, next week... I want you to go to St. Francis Hospital, and I want you to go in there and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, because uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. But I, want you, I want you to know that right now. People that claim to be faith healers never end up in any hospital I've ever seen them in. Just kind of thinking about that. Uh, and it even says, do not acquire, verse 9, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals. In other words, he gives them a, a paradigm in which was only good for that time. And for that journey that they were going on, we would never say it to anybody today, if you want to be a missionary, you got to adhere to Matthew chapter 10. I don't know how that would work out. Because most missionaries don't even have a, a Jewish background to start with. So we'd have issues going on. So what we left off last week is this identity of this announced kingdom. Jesus is announcing a kingdom. Um, I know there's a lot of people today that say we're in the kingdom now. And I'm going to say something as nicely as I can. If this is it, I want out. This is not any kingdom. Uh, this has so many issues. Um, and it's not run by a king. Uh, even if Trump might someday think he's a king. This is not run by a king. It is not the nation that God has given and the paradigm in which God's given to the nation of Israel. He's, we're not in that. 
Uh, so we got to ask what's going on at that time. So we kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, we kind of ventured through some of these points. I just want to refer, refer, refresh our memory on just a couple of points, and then we'll go back to point three, I think. It, three. Uh, there was no formal definition of ever given to the kingdom as announced to the Jewish audience who were expected to know exactly what the kingdom meant. If I said to somebody here something specific, they should understand what I'm talking about. So if we're talking about sports and we're talking about different things, last night, how many of you really got engrossed in the Alliance League of American Football? Nobody, right? I mean, who watched it? Their attendance is down now by at least 50, 60. Um, but you, most of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about, right? Because I haven't defined any terms, haven't told you anything that's going on. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, his audience fully understood exactly what he meant. He never defined the terms. So I want to make sure we understand that. So when we're, we're dealing with that, we have to understand in which Matthew is opening up, this, this is the kingdom that's presented. Um, it's surely not a kingdom in the hearts, because think of the, the Pharisees. And their, their hearts, and what if the kingdom was in their heart? Never, it never happened. Secondly, therefore, Lord never intimated that his con- conception of the kingdom differed from what was presented in the prophets. One of the things we've, di- we've done in the last couple of years here, we've gone through Ezekiel, the minor prophets, and now we're going through Isaiah, and their presentation of that coming kingdom. We've said it many times. And that's the thing the prophets spoke about. What was to come? And Jesus says, what was to come is now at hand. No different. They fully understood that. The terms of the kingdom and son of man used by the Messiah, so this is where we're at today, these terms used, kingdom of heaven and son of man used by Messiah in preaching the kingdom, are only significant in light of Old Testament prophecies. I'm going to say something as nicely and as pastorally as possible. If you open up Matthew and have no idea what the Old Testament says, you may need to go back and read the Old Testament. Because Matthew doesn't open up in a vacuum. Matthew opens up in a paradigm that the Jewish people of the first century understood, fully understood, because it had been ingrained in them, and in the silence of those 400 years, they were looking for someone to usher in the kingdom, especially with Roman domination over them. They wanted the freedom from the Romans bad, and they knew Messiah would come. Just so you would know, Jesus isn't the only Messiah announced during that time period. There was, uh, not only during his time period, but even before his time period and after his time period, many false messiahs. So what we have laid out, especially in Matthew, is the presentation of the Messiah and all his credentials. No one else had these credentials. For instance, years ago, uh, there was a Rabbi Sherenson in New York who claimed to be the Messiah. His minions bought bus signs that said, Rab- Rabbi Sherenson, the Messiah. And it used to go run around New York saying he was the Messiah. But here's what Sherenson did. He died. And he's still in that whatever tomb he's in. He died. He never, never Raised anybody from the dead, never did a miracle, never, never pronounced any of the, uh, for, and probably was not born of a virgin, nor did he have Davidic uh, genealogy whatsoever, because he couldn't prove it. Um, so when you have all these issues, you just have a claim to be Messiah, and if you have enough followers believing it, you become Messiah. When I lived in South Florida, there was a black group called Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Anybody ever heard of Yahweh Ben Yahweh? <laughs> Sorry, John. Yahweh ben Yahweh claimed to be Messiah. No way. Just, I'm just going to be as simple as that. No way. So when you have this, you got to say, what was happening in Jesus' time when things lined up and he came in the fullness of time, born of a virgin? What was going on? And that's, that's as clearly as we see Matthew opening. And I want to say this. As we question some of the things that are Matthew, Matthew is the very word of God. There are same things we may not fully understand, but it is the Word of God. Please don't anybody start um, Googling Yahweh ben Yahweh right now to overload the Internet. So, uh, but he did make a sermon, so that's good. Um, fourthly, our Lord consistently appealed to the Old Testament to support his claim, kingly claim and his message 
of the kingdom. Now here's what we have when we look through Matthew. How many times is the Old Testament referred to? And how many times do we say, uh, can we say as we look through it that that was fulfilled in that time? Now, just let's step back for a second. When we talk about these two terms, I forgot to mention this, son of man, a very interesting term that's used 82 times in the New Testament. 82 times. It should be pretty significant, right? We should understand what it means. Uh, uh, when, when one sees that, we have to understand that Jesus, from his own eyes, accepted this terminology about himself. Um, the only other times it's used outside of that is basically when Stephen is being stoned in Acts. And uh, a question that's being asked in Hebrews, so that's two times. And the third time, well, actually two times in Revelation where it says one is coming like the Son of Man. So we have four terms where Jesus did not use it of himself. But it's used of him. So we have to understand it's very much a terminology that Jesus used. We'll look at it in a minute uh, because we need to go somewhere to see that. So when we talk about that, um, we also have to understand the kingdom of heaven was announced when John the Baptist was baptizing. It's the first time it's ever announced that there's a kingdom of heaven at hand. So go with me to Daniel chapter 2 real quick. Daniel chapter 2. I digress for a moment, but I want you to see something. Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel is in the midst of giving an interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He's the only one that could do it. And when we get to verse 44, if you have a study Bible, it'll say this is Christ's kingdom that's established on earth. So we have this divine kingdom that comes from heaven uh, to destroy and supplant kingdoms existing on earth. So we have four kingdoms that rise before this, and each kingdom is supplanted by the previous kingdom. And then Christ's kingdom, and says in verse 44, and in those days, and in the days of those kings of of, uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. See, that's why I'm a literal understander of scripture because he says it will never be destroyed so we're not in the kingdom now because this time period is going to be destroyed at some point and that kingdom will be uh, not be left for another people it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will itself endure forever so when we're studying and we've been studying in isaiah on wednesday nights this is a promo for a second a little introduction on Wednesday nights. We've been talking about the oracles against different nations. And God's going to come in some point and destroy all these nations. It's right out of Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Verse 45 said, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great, God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. In the future. Uh, see Revelation. Uh, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So one of the things we know that's apparent that we, we see Matt, Daniel's prophecy starting to be fulfilled within Christ's offer of the kingdom. Um, if you go over to chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Again, a, prof- a prophecy given about a dream, uh, Daniel's vision of the four beasts that are risen. In verse 13, it says, I will keep looking in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up from the ancient of days and was presented before him, and he was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and every and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So when you look at the Old Testament in this real quick glance of the understanding of the kingdom in Daniel, we know that it's a kingdom that will be forever, that's going to be ushered in when the Messiah, the king, comes. Jesus was offering that in Matthew. That was the offer given when the book of Matthew. And we look at this message has gone given over and over again. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. And we'll probably put this under this. That he, and there's going to be times as we're going through Matthew, we'll have to look at Luke. Uh, Luke gives a different perspective. And sometimes we got to look. A real good thing to do, and I was thinking about doing that, is get a harmony of the Gospels and see how they read out 
uh, and probably teach through that one time, but that's more difficult. But what we're going to see in Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, again, is that offer. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover your sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So one of the things we have here is this proclamation given. Notice what it says. And he closed the book. The book, what book did he have open? The book of uh, Isaiah, okay? He's reading Isaiah in the temple, and he came back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's a huge claim, don't you think? That he's sitting there saying, Today, it's been fulfilled. And we noticed the reaction was that all who were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips... And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? In other words, can this only be, this is just a man. And let your eyes wander down just a little, well, yeah, just go down to verse 24. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. So he's even claiming to be the prophet. And he goes on and says, but I say to you, in truth, there are there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when the great famine came to land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Sepharath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now, the reason he's saying that is because he's there, he's doing what? He's, he's doing all for everybody. He's better than those prophets. And his credentials are much grander. Uh, go to chapter 24, Luke. Now, I know we're not studying the book of Luke, but I think the things in Luke are applicable to the time of Matthew because it's the same thing going on. Luke, Matthew's focus is a little different than Luke's, however, that's all. So we're in Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Uh, let's get verse 25 first. And he said to them, O foolish men, these are the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, do you believe in all the things the prophets have spoken? Now, I'm going to say something nicely. Maybe. If you don't know all the prophets have spoken, your ability to believe more is lesser. You have to know what the prophecies were. And he, Jesus is knowing the background of these guys who knew what the Scripture said. They, they knew it. They were ingrained since birth on the Scriptures and the prophets, but they didn't believe all. He says, verse 26, Was it not necessary? Please cross this word out. Not necessary for the Christ. It should be Messiah. They wouldn't understand Christ. Uh, and we'll explain why, why the variations there. Um, but if you have a New American Standard Version and you look out to the side column, what does it say about that word Christ? Anybody have it? Messiah, thank you. So let's go with Messiah. It's a better translation. Uh, especially if we're talking to a Jewish people, a Jewish audience on a, on a road with uh, discussing Old Testament prophecies. I don't know how Christ would work with them. Uh, Verse 26 again, was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Have you not read Isaiah 53? That's part of what was going on, right? Then he goes on, in the, and beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he exegeted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Wow. Ready for this? Can you take the Old Testament and show Jesus in the Old Testament? Can you prove what Jesus was to do and to be and to become in the Old Testament? That's the only scriptures they had. And Jesus sat down and opened him up to him. In other words, Luke wasn't written at that time. Matthew wasn't written at the time. He opened up the scriptures and said, here's who I am. Can you see very clearly Messiah in the Old Testament? That's a challenge to us, isn't it? I think we spent many times in many different ways of looking at, but when Jesus came, he consistently appealed to the Old Testament to support that he was the king and that what he was about to usher in was truly for the nation of Israel that they should have clearly understood. And he opens up uh, in Matthew with the genealogy of a king. So, fifthly, 
The gospel records always, always, the, the connection of the kingdom proclaimed with the kingdom prophesied. There's a connection. He's not saying there's a disconnect or there's something different. If the, if the terms of kingdom was changed, Jesus would have told you. Uh, most teachers try and over-clarify things prayerfully. If you've ever had a decent teacher and you say, you know, I don't understand that term. Can you clarify that? They will clarify that. And if, they're, if they think you understand the English they're speaking and understand terms in their literal sense, you don't have to say which one. So when I say kingdom in this venue, you shouldn't say which one. There's only one. Okay? Um, so Jesus didn't change any of the terms. When he uses terms uh, within, he has a, a, a good understanding of his audience and understands what they would have understand. Uh, one of the things that, well, let's just look at this. Um, Psalm, let's go to Psalm 72. Let's go to a few places. Psalm 72. So I'm going to be here at about 4 o'clock today. I don't have a time constraint. Psalm 72. One of the things we see from Psalm 72, we're just going to go to a few verses, but uh, the psalmist here is Solomon, and he's writing, Blessed be the Lord God, verse 18, sorry. Blessed be the Lord God the God of Israel, who alone works wonders. So we see one of the things from the Old Testament, that God does wonders. The God of Israel will do wonders. When Jesus came, one of the things he did was wonders. Did signs, miracles, and wonders. Uh, Turn over since we're in the Psalms, go to 89. 89. And what we have here is a a short repetition of the Davidic covenant. And we're going to start in verse um, verse 20, well, 19. Once thou didst speak in vision to the godly ones and didst say, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand be established, will be established, my arm will be strengthened, will strengthen him, the enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him, but I will crush his adversaries before him, strike those who hate him. So we have a, a look at a, a David the king, a Davidic look at what would be happening, but we see a, a longer reach in verse 33, but I will break off my loving kindness from him, nor do, I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal false, uh, falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have spoken by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Here's the kicker. His descendants shall endure forever. His throne as the sun before me. So it will be established forever like the moon and the witness of the sky is faithful. David's throne was promised to be a forever throne. If we have anything to say now about this time period, it's really not about the church. It's about the interrogum, the time period. There's no one on David's throne. We're looking for a time that David, someone will reign from David's throne again because God made a promise. I don't know what to do with that. I'm a literal Bible teacher. I can't allegorize that and say, well, the throne is in your heart. David doesn't want to be in your heart, neither does Jesus. Okay? He wants to be, what he said, in his, on his throne, in the nation of Israel, in Jerusalem, and it says throne of David kind of idea. So when we talk about these gospel connections, we see from the Old Testament that those things had to be fulfilled. Uh, we can go on many more uh, different things that's going on. Uh, one of the things was interesting when in Luke, go back to Luke chapter 2. I feel like I'm teaching Luke more than Matthew today. Luke 2. An interesting uh, vignette here that's given. Luke 2, Luke also, not Luke 2, Luke, we're in Luke 2, but Luke also has a very Jewish background. You have to understand certain things that are going on. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25. 
There's a seasoned citizen that's involved here in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him, was upon him. And it, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Again, please put Messiah in there. So Simeon knew somehow from some... Uh, Again, we're in a different time period. The Lord talked to him in different ways and, and dealt with him. He said, you're not going to die till you see the Messiah. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, Jesus was having his uh, bris, his circumcision, uh, his dedication ceremony. Verse 28 says, then he took him into his arms and blessed him and said, thou art, thou, now Lord, now Lord, thou dost uh, let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and a glory of thy people Israel. So this little baby was to be the light of the world. Wow, that sounds like Gospel of John, right? He was to be the Savior of all, and his father and mother were amazed at these things which were being said. Uh, fascinating thing. Drop down to verse 36, and another person there was the... Now, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. Uh, Just for you that want to just talk about different things about the Bible and say this has got to be because there's lost tribes of Israel. Asher was one of those lost tribes, and this lady's from the tribe of what? Asher, so the tribe wasn't lost. You get what I'm saying? It is. It may be now, because we don't have biblical records, but at this time she's from the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, so she was also a, a seasoned citizen, having lived with her husband seven years uh, after her marriage, and then as a widow uh, to the age of 84. And she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And at the very moment she came up and, and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to of him, to the, all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. A fascinating time period that she's doing, that she's looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. There was someone to bring that in. And the reason I bring this up is because this is in light of the Old Testament. This is not anything new to them. We, we do have the preponderance of it, much more information that Jesus had presented himself clearly in the connection with that coming kingdom that was prophesied. Um, it, there's, a, there's a, in Matthew, uh, let's turn to this. Matthew chapter 9, interesting thing. In that connection with that idea. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Now, we're going to see a lot of interaction, and hopefully this morning we'll, we'll deal with this a little bit. We're going to see a lot of interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. Uh, Pharisees were the leading Jewish people at the time. Uh, we'll talk about them again a little later. But the disciples, verse 14, the disciples of John came to him saying, why do, why, do we, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? That's a good question, right? What's the purpose of fasting? We'll talk about that when we get to Matthew chapter 9. But this is what Jesus answered. The attendants of the bridegroom do not mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? What's Jesus claiming? He's the Messiah. He's the bridegroom. He's the one that will bring the nation of Israel to its proper place. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast, because they'll be in what state? I'll say the morning. Those are interesting things that are going on at that time. Uh, Go to chapter 12. Matthew 12, 15. And what we're just doing is getting a quick glimpse of different things that are going on now in the book of Matthew that have to do with this king and kingdom. And Matthew chapter 12 is a fascinating turning point in the book. But verse 15, Matthew 12, 15 says, But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew himself from there, and many followed him, and he healed them. He healed them what? All. Um, I'm kind of a literalist again. I think all means some of the people. 
It means all the people, right? So when Jesus was coming by, he wasn't selecting a few that may have had a migraine headache or the sniffles last week. He was healing every type of disease that was going on at that time uh, and, and problems uh, and warned them not to make him known. What? Why? Because it wasn't just the right time for what he had to do. Timing is everything. In order, listen, in order that was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Saying. So he's fulfilling what? Prophecy. Fascinating. Okay? So if he's fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah that he's claiming, is there another Messiah to come? Are, the, are we expecting a different one? Was Jesus, well, Jesus was okay. He was just a good teacher, but he wasn't a Messiah. We're expecting another one, Rabbi Shearson. Let's see if he could fit that. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations, the Gentiles. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. I, I don't know if Rabbi Shearson reached out to any Gentiles. If you know anything that was going up in that period uh, where he was in New York, they were not reaching out to anybody. They were a very inclusive club at that time. And um, we just look at this. Jesus was there for not only to the Jews first, but also to the Gentiles at that time. Uh, so when we talk about this, to the, in this climate that we have in the fifth point here, there's nothing new for the Jewish people. This is a central place in the Old Testament prophecies concerning God's relation to them as a nation and he as their king. It's very clear. Uh, in the days of the coming kingdom, we, we have that picture of the divine bridehood appears in Isaiah 61 and Hosea chapter 3. But Christ knowing, because uh, I, I don't want to get into that right now, but we can at another point, probably when we get into those prophecies that deal with that in chapter 9 and 10. But Christ, knowing the Old Testament and the meaning of the prophetic setting of a divine bridegroom in relation to repentant Israel, is the idea of the coming kingdom. All of that involves a coming kingdom. And he assumes for himself Jesus as the place of the bridegroom. Right, that's clear as we can possibly be. Jesus is that bridegroom. And when Jesus comes... Again, there will be no mourning on earth. I copied this out of a, I can't remember, I should have wrote it down, but uh, copied this out of a commentary. In the divine person of the regal bridegroom, the long-promised kingdom was at hand. And in his presence, for those who had acknowledged him, it was a time for great rejoicing and great feasting. In this connection, a careful reading of the entire 54th chapter of Isaiah will illuminate our Lord's reference uh, to his presence as the royal bridegroom for Israel. And when Jesus said that, the people knew that. Instead of fasting, his people were, were, must break forth in singing. Just think of the glorious, you know, we sang a couple of songs this morning. I love It Is Well With My Soul, right? Uh, when I was in choir, the choir director, his name was Doug McCall. He was very sticky. Make sure you say, it is well with your soul, because it's not swell with your soul. Because when Horatio wrote this, he wrote this in the same place where his wife and kids had drowned in a boat accident. And as the boat was going over, it wasn't swell with his soul. It was well with his soul what God had done. And I said, to this day, I said, that's a fantastic thing. Think what we'll be singing as we all get together in that heavenly choir, as we worship the king. Isn't that cool? Uh, I won't worry about having to stand in the back and make sure nobody's listening. We can all, all rejoice together. Sixthly, the events attending the appearance of the Messiah King indicate a literal identity between the kingdom priest and that of the Old Testament prophecy. So when we look at this, there is no difference. So when we say this happened in the Old Testament, but that's different than what Jesus was doing, no, they were the same thing. No, no details are left out. So when we connect all the dots as we go through Matthew, we'll see that that kingdom that was prophesied is with the kingdom Jesus presented. Oops, I don't know how... Okay. Hmm. 
little guy didn't want to save that. Okay, we'll, 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 we're going to go, we're going to just go off of that. Don't look at that for a minute. I don't know where that got stuck. But the next slides, let me just talk to you about these things, because I don't think you need slides for these. What I'm going to talk about to you a little bit is the Jewish leadership at the time of Christ. When Christ came, what was the going on in Judaism? Because what happens is some people take Judaism today, and we'll talk about that too, and slam it back into the New Testament times, and you have an issue with that, because Judaism today is not the Judaism of the New Testament times. You with me so far? For instance, we'll see names like this mentioned, Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essians won't be mentioned, but they are in the background, and Zealots. Those are the four main types of of leaders within Judaism at that time. Uh, Pharisees, let's talk about them quickly as possible. This was a lay group, not a religious or priestly. Uh, They were uh, rabbis. You've heard the name rabbi or the title rabbi. That would come later after the fall of the temple in 70 AD. Jesus is called Rabboni. Just means teacher. It's it's not a title per se, as we would say, Rabbi Sherenson today, or Rabbi Cohn, or Rabbi whatever. That's that's modern day era, what we call rabbinic Judaism. That's not what was happening at that time. So Pharisees basically uh, were um, not per se spiritual or political, even though they kept both ideas, because they they became a group that took uh, the understanding of what was going on and basically overloaded the people with different ideas. Their their uh, yoke of bondage they put upon the people they could not, they themselves, first of all, wouldn't bear. But they wanted to make sure you, as a people group, would have borne that. Uh, uh, let's do this. So I'm, I'm kind of distracted by that thing in the side. So let's just put it off. Um, that works out. Uh, what happens is, later the rabbis... Uh, after this t- temple got destroyed in 70 AD, proposed a templeless uh, venue that Jewish faith could be centered around four religious practices. So after the temple period, here's what Jews did, and probably still adhere to much today. They would they want to study the Torah. The Torah is the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the five books of Moses, but most or the law, but most of the time it refers to the Hebrew Scriptures. So it was all about Torah, prayer repentance, and charity. If you did those four things, you were a good Jew. Okay? To the, to the time that the rabbis started rising in a temple, templeless society. Um, so today, if you were to ask a rabbi, what are the sacrifices you make? What, what would you do to make sacrifices? He, they would say something to you, be repentant, spend time in prayer, uh, maybe do good works, which are the charities. Uh, today, however, most of Judaism is not adhered to that. Most of Judaism today is shaped around uh, a, a secular understanding. Uh, and we'll deal with that as we deal with the different kinds of Judaism today. But these Pharisees held a very strict observance of the traditions of the written law and co- that were commonly held. So at this time, there was written law being made. The oral laws of different teaching were being established and being uh, put together and organized. So they had a lot of different laws that they would put up, and you would never find a Bible verse for them. And Jesus will uh, condemn them in the end of Matthew quite vigorously and calling them things like, you brood of vipers. I don't know how that would go over today if you went into a religious center and called them all a brood of vipers or whitewashed cups, clean on the, uh, on the outside, but filthy inside. I don't know if that would go over well. Well, I don't give that to you as an evangelistic tool. Um, but Jesus was dealing with what they had done. They had, they had lifted traditions above the Word of God. And many of you are familiar with that, right? Anybody seen Fiddle on the Roof? The, the lead song is called what? traditions, traditions, right? It's all about traditions. What about the Word of God? Well, we got the Word of God, and he quotes from it, I don't know how many times, Tevye, and never once is it from the Word of God. It's from Tevye's Word of God, okay? Um, So what happened, and it still happens today, is, is oral law and traditions are held much higher, and in some stems of Judaism today, um, the 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 scriptures are really not even adhered to. They're just nice stories. 
and which nauseates me to the nth degree. I, I spent a, uh, a few hours with a rabbi, and he was telling us all about different things a couple weeks ago. And the f- funniest thing at the very end, I said, of his little speech on Genesis 1, I said, so I assume you're not an evolutionist. And the first thing he said to me is, don't assume anything. Well, he just told me all about God creating and how God did all these things. Uh, and, and he did it in six days and so on. And so, uh, so I assume... From your clear reading, no, you know, because it's, it's really good what? It's a really good story. We're supposed to get something more spiritual out of it, not really say it's literal. Uh, just so you know, six literal days, six literal days God created, okay? I will stick with that and stand with that. Um, look at Matthew 25 real quick. I want you to get a look at the Pharisees, uh, a viewpoint of the Pharisees in Matthew 25. Verse 25, uh, chapter, chapter 25, verse 26. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not reap, gather seed. So what he's talking about is these people were, were doing things that were beyond the scope of Scripture. Verse 23, chapter 23 is clearer on some. I wanted to go backwards for chapter 23. Got to go back to 23. Um, chapter 23. If, if you have a woe version of Matthew, the woes will stick out because you look at, uh, and then he's all talking to the Pharisees in this situation. Um, verse 2 says, The scribes and the Pharisees were seated themselves in the chairs, chair of Moses. They were put themselves in a the place of spiritual authority. Verse 13 says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That works out well. Verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, verse 16, blind guides. Uh, the, you, verse 17, you fools and blind men. Uh, this doesn't go over well with if you're trying to give a speech to an engrandized people to you, you know. Uh, verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and, mint, uh, and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Uh, verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which are on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead man's bones and uncleanliness. I don't know about you all, that, that doesn't make the political speech of the year. Jesus is king, and he's saying you guys need to get out of this situation because you're presenting and misrepresenting who God is and, and putting upon people things that they did not need. Secondly, not only Pharisees, there were Sadducees. Now, a lot of people make fun of them because they believe Sadducees were sad because they didn't believe in the resurrection. But it works because they didn't. They didn't. They didn't believe in the existence of spirits either, and they thought the obligation of oral tradition emphasized were uh, the emphasis was higher on oral tradition and the uh, 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 emphasizing also the exception of written law. But again, oral oral tradition was higher. They reigned from the second century B.C. to about 70 A.D. They maintained the temple. Their big thing was the maintenance of the temple. Temple gone, they're out of a job. Uh, they were, they were a priestly division within Israel. They were involved in politics. They collected the taxes. That's funny because I told you Levi was probably a priest. Levi might have even been a Sadducee because he collected the taxes. They were involved in uh, uh, also in equipping and led an ar- a temple army. Later we'll see that there will be not only Rome's army, but there was a temple-led coalition a militia group. They were leaders of that. Uh, and, and they also tried to regulate relations between the Jews and the Romans. Uh, they me- mediated domestic quarrels. So they're very much involved in, okay, Jesus is stirring up the factions. Let's kind of stop that as much as possible. In Scripture, we'll see mostly the Pharisees and Sadducees together with a common enemy. They both didn't want anything to do with Jesus, so they banded together even though they were factious among themselves. They didn't agree probably on anything, you know. Uh, Well, probably a few things, but 
Third group was the Zealots. One of the disciples was called Simon the Zealot. Uh, if you, what they did was these were little thugs in society who had a zeal for Zionism. They wanted Israel to rule and to reign, and they would do it by taking these little short daggers they usually carried in their back, and they would uh, systematically kill people. They are a very political group. Uh, Josephus, the historian, refers to them as the fourth sect. The, the Hebrew word that associates them with them is the kanaim, uh, those who are very zealous on behalf of God. The Greek word here is zeliots, and that means the admirer or follower. So they're a very strict group that thought the best way to get society to change was knock off a few of these guys. Um, which is fascinating because when Jesus is taken uh, by the the uh, centurions to, that night that he was before he's crucified, Peter's the one that wields the sword. Simon doesn't. So it's just kind of interesting to see what the Lord had done to Simon, that he was no longer that kind of a, a zealot, even though Scripture constantly refers to him as a zealot. The last group isn't really mentioned in Scripture, um, but I believe... Uh, some of it may be attributed to John the Baptist. He had an Essian quality. Uh, these Essians, if you want to spell it, is E-S-S-E-N-E-S. They, reign, they were around from about 130 B.C. to about 70 A.D., had a tremendous impact in history. If anybody knows what happens at Masada, anybody heard of Masada? The last standout for Jews during the Roman time of uh, trying to get rid of all the Jews from Israel. And they, there was a few that were left on the mountaintop of Masada. The only way up was one way at that time, and it was blocked. They, they held out, and they had a suicide pact between themselves. And they all died, I think, except, I, I believe, two I'm trying to remember from my trip in Israel. They, it, it, within there, there was a lot of interesting things in Masada that they had. But they had a little room that would show you where they, the scribes would sit and transcribe the Word of God. The Essenes were very meticulous at copying the Word of God. And later, uh, about 19, I think it was 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were, I think it was 40 somewhere in there, that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Uh, many different copies. It was near the area. The Quaram is, is a few miles north of Masada, but th- they're attributed those copies to the Essenes. Um, so I think, and I believe this beyond a shadow, that a lot of the good copies we have of the whole entire Bible was f- found during the because of the Essenes at that time. These were a group of Stoics and Separatists. We could think of them as a group that were like monkish. They thought they would get away from society. They wouldn't be infected by society. They would have their little uh, establishment up at at this particular point in Masada. Um, But they were not like, even though John John was like them because he had lived out in the wilderness, they were unlike John because they were never public figures. And that's why I think the New Testament really never says anything about them because they didn't come out. They weren't anti-Jesus. They weren't pro-Jesus. They just weren't there. They were busy doing something else. Um, and not, unlike Jesus, they never preached that Jesus was the Lamb of God. <laughs> so I mean, you, so when you're talking about whether John the Baptist was or was not, uh, I think John the Baptist was John the Baptist. I don't think he's lined up with any particular. Today, there's an Essian Church of Christ. I think that's funny. <laughs> I don't know what else to do with that. They're Essian... So if you go by the terminology, they're separatists or copying the Word of God. They're really not involved. They're Church of Christ, so they believe in John's baptism, I guess, for salvation. So they're kind of mixed a bunch of things, and they're called the the Church of Christ. They believe in Messiah, I guess. I don't know what's going on. Uh, But they have nothing to do with any Judaism whatsoever. They're just a sect of Christianity. Uh, So we got those four things that were happening in biblical times. We have Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, and Essenes. So that gives us a good religious type of background that Jesus is up against. The backdrop is they always came up, though at least the Sadducees, Pharisees, and scribes. Scribes were an offshoot, probably the Pharisees. Uh, uh, They were the lawyers, not the writers. They weren't the Essenes. They were lawyers. They knew the word of God, and they would use it against you as much as they could, um, not for you. Um, But those are the backdrop to the movement that was going on this time. But what about today's Judaism? How would you classify today's Judaism? 
Okay, if you run into a Jew, what type of Jew are you running into? Uh, and, and what do you usually have? Um, so I'm going to start with what scares the bejeebas out of most people is the Hasidics. Uh, Hasidic Jews are usually the ones we see with the black long coats, the big hats, the the uh, earlock hair from their which is called pace pace a pay uh, I totally lost my th- anyway the the long earlobe things they uh, um, kind of stand out in society. Uh, they have a head they have some kind of big hat on or something covering their head. They they're very religious. You'll see lots of them, especially around the western wall of Israel, because right across from there is one of the Hasidic uh, uh, schools of the Bible, I guess, Torah. No, it didn't even Torah. Talmudic schools. They're not studying the Bible, really. They're studying. They're very pious people. Believe it or not, they came out of Poland in about the 18th century. Although they were very strict, um, uh, Orthodox group, their eruption in the Jew- world of Jewry was very traumatic. They have, listen to this, a tremendous messianic fervor. Listen, it's very important. Because when you say messianic Jew, most people don't get this. What's a messianic Jew? Now, you could say it's a Jewish believer that believes Jesus is their Messiah. I'm okay with that. But sometimes uh, you look at what is in Messianic Judaism today, it's more of a Messianic than it is Messiah-oriented. It's a mess. Uh, sometimes you'll even see in Messianic Judaism, the rabbi is Gentile. I don't know about you all, but I kind of like, I have an issue with that. Um, uh, and I have lots of issues. But the point is, they look for Messiah. They're looking for Messiah. The difference is, I found him. It's not hard to find. He's been there all along. So I don't necessarily ever call myself a messianic. Thing. First of all, that term is absolutely confusing because uh, these Hasidic Jews would look for Messiah. Secondly, you have reform movement. This started around uh, 19th century as a commitment to adopt and explain the ritual and basic religious concepts of Judaism for life in a new realistic liberal West. Um, they looked uh, looked at as a halfway house to complete assimilation from being from a uh, culture that they were used to. Uh, most of these Jews came out of Europe and under great uh, programs and atro- atrocious uh, times, not only, and remember this is before the Holocaust. There was other things that were going on that were very atrocious. They came out of that and they wanted to assimilate with the world and still be, uh, you know, Jewish. The word Hasidic didn't want to assimilate with the world at all. They could care less and probably wrote it off. And the Reformed wanted to align with that. Some of the thoughts of Reformed is we're not a nation anymore, properly speaking, but a people of a particular religious persuasion. So they weren't looking at their nationalism as much as their individualism as a group. Secondly, Jews were to be loyal citizens of their adoptive countries. Uh, one of the things you'll see is Jews very much assimilated very easily into society because Jews that came in, I never used a hyphenated word. I'm not, I'm not an American Jew, per se. I'm not a Russian, uh, Russian-American Jew. Uh, I'm American. My family has assimilated in, and that's part of the idea that, that happens is they become part of society. They, they didn't want, they were looking at ways not to be ostracized and, and persecuted. Okay. Thirdly, mixed seating of men and women together. So in this congregation, you would be considered reformed. Some temples, you would have women on one side, men on the other. I would be able to speak, and some of them would even have a curtain right down the middle so you couldn't cross check aisles, you know. You, you just it would be there, and I'd be able to see both groups and talk to both groups, but there'd be the wall of separation. Uh, but Reform Judaism does not have that. They they use the Hebrew language and the native tongue of their land. So they're, they're most of them, if they come from the old land, they're bilingual or even trilingual or multilingual. They uh they also uh. They also have the full role of women at every level of leadership, even rabbinics. So today you'll see women that are cantors. Those are the ones that lead singing, uh, worship in, in, in the temple. They could be women. The rabbis could be women. So you have that mix of going on, um, basically Methodist of Judaism. I'm sure I'm getting cards and letters from friends. Please address them to the church. Not to me personally. Uh, they're very open 
to interfaith dialogue, which is kind of interesting. Because I went to one of these when I first got to Tulsa. This uh, Reformed Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish temple was leading this interfaith dialogue. And it really wasn't interfaith dialogue. It was all the faiths that were there I'd have nothing to do with because it would have nothing to do with my Bible. Um, the rabbi got up to introduce the groups to everybody, and he said this. It's ingrained in my mind forever. We all have different ways to the top of the mountain. I guess the top of the mountain to him was heaven. And he says, there's different roads and different treks to get up there. Some of ours may be more, more, uh, uh, have more obstacles or more things to do to get there, but we'll all arrive at the mountaintop together. So that's why we're here meeting today together. And the first thing I was doing in the back row going, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> like, what Bible are you reading? We all have different ways to get to heaven. We don't need Jesus then. And that's what they promote. Uh, again, it's, I think it's a, a, a way to be accepted into this society and not to be persecuted. Because, And I, I'm going to say this as nice as I can. Jews can't escape persecution. It's, it's going to happen. It's, 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 it's a given. Um, they're more of a social Judaism than anything to do with law-oriented or traditional Judaism. It's, it's basically a big... So, I wouldn't call them secular because they actually come together and they have a temple and they have a place. They have a rabbi or rabbis, kind of thing. Then you have ultra-Orthodox, which are a little different than the Hasidic. That was about 19th century that that was formed. Those who advocated... And you see, most of these came out of the 18th and 19th century when a lot of persecution was happening to the Jews past the Spanish... You know, the Spanish Revolution was horrible. In 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, his ship left the last morning before the final persecution of Jews. Think that through. Just conversation. So that was a horrible time under the Spanish Inquisition that was going on. Okay? But, but that didn't stop anything. There was many persecutions that had, had, that had gone out through different nations. And I think a lot of these came out of that. So in the 19th century, uh, those who advocated reform and those who uh, hold on to the status quo in Hungary, uh, or Hungary, whichever way you want to say it. Some of you may be just be getting hungry because it's noon, but... Um, I'm just going to give you two more real quick. Um, so hang on. I know we're going two minutes over. The only one I really got to worry about is my wife because she's in with the kids. So Anyway, uh, they differ from the Hasidim because they came out of a different arena. That's all it comes from. It's where did they come from, which stem of the world they came from. So they're very, they are orthodox. The Nero, last group I really want to talk about this morning um, and we'll talk about the other ones next week. There's there's a bunch of different ones, but the, the neo-orthodox. These are came out of the mid-century, uh, 19th century, from Germany, Italy, where the Jewish leaders sought to wed something of the possibilities of modern Judeo- Jewish interaction uh, with the best of non-Jewish culture and the basic tenets and practices of traditional Judaism. In other words, they kind of toe defense. They were, they were all about the written and oral law being a revelation from God, but at the same time, we got to be somehow accepted in the society, and uh, they believed our revealed religion, but was also a host for the culture's wisdom. So they, they were talking about religion involved with wisdom of the world. Today's form of those who are, uh, are those hold to a very Talmudic uh, study uh, they, they, they study, not only do they study Talmud, but they go to a lot of modern universities and bring in their Talmudic studies. So they'll have a Talmudic study group as they're studying um, Greek philosophy or medicine or whatever they're studying. So what they wanted to gain was a perfect amalgamation of Jewish life and Jewish non-life, Jewish religious life and, and Jewish uh, intelligence that's going on, and a lot of those went to very high standards of school. A very smart group of people. But a per- they wanted that perfect mix uh, of faithfulness to Judaism and its religion while interacting with the world in meaningful ways that brought about an amalgamation in the, with them. So to kind of, if you notice, there's a similarity with a lot of groups, just how orthodox does one be, you know? And a lot of these, um, I remember there was a I can't remember who he was. There was a Jewish baseball player that never played on Saturday. And they all accepted that because he was, he was from this neo-Orthodox group. He wanted to amalgamate in with people, but at the same time, he wanted to hold to some of the Jewish laws. It wasn't Sandy Koufax. No, I'm pretty sure Sandy did play in a few games when he did 
I think he bent a little bit. I know that's one of the names. But anyway, we'll pick up with the rest of this next week. And here's where we're going to go next week. So I got a little bit of homework for you guys. We're going to be in the first chapter of Matthew, no matter what. I only have a few more points to bring forth in introduction. But we're going to be in Matthew. Please read through. Here's what I want. And this is important. If you read through it, you're ready to, for, to study. But I want you to ask questions. I want you to ask questions, because this is going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to ask questions, too, because I read it, and there's a ton of questions I got. A ton of questions. I don't get some of those things, but I, I, listen, we're going to learn together. But the genealogy, read chapter 1, 1 through 17. That's all we're going to do. 17 verses, and here's the thing. Pronounce the names right. Um, I would say this. Go find out what the right pronunciation is. Matthew holds to the Greek writing. It's not the Hebrew names. So you'll see a difference. You'll say, who's that guy? And you go, oh. And it, so, and uh, ask questions. I would give you more, but I would kill my sermon for next week. So. <laughs>